Hey everybody, welcome back to Leosophy. It is very fitting that today's topic is bee diseases, as uh, I have the flu, which is also why I don't have a beard and hair anymore. Like, I never get sick, and when I am sick, I'm like, I can't deal with this. I don't want hair, I don't want anything in my way, and so I just, yeah, anyway, uh, back to the topic at hand, um, bee diseases are a very real issue, but they should not be something at the forefront of your mind when it comes to buying bees, uh, as long as you buy from a reputable, uh, breeder, that's, that's really the important thing, do not buy, this is something to look out for, do not ever buy bees, from somebody who's just selling like a full hive. Unless you know that person personally and you know they're a stand-up guy or whatever. Because it's very suspicious. Like, why would somebody be selling that? It's like, it's like you know, beware a regular Joe who's selling a brand new car. Like, why would you sell a brand new car? You're not a car dealer. What's wrong with that car? It's the same thing. Like, why are you, you say you've got a hive and it's full of honey? And it's harvest time, but you're selling me the hive for $150? Like, like you know, the hive has like $400 worth of honey in it, and you, like, none of that makes sense, right? So, yeah, you know, if you're going to buy bees, packages, or nukes, uh, as discussed in a previous video. Also, another little, little thing to bring up, I don't think I'd brought it up last time, and I mentioned things that you should have uh, for, for starting beekeeping. By the way, cough drop, not bloody mouth. Um, uh things that you should have. I don't think I mentioned an EpiPen. And by the way, they make generic EpiPens. So I'm, I'm using the term because I don't know the name of the generic. But, you know, I encourage people to have those anyway because you might save somebody's life even if you don't have allergies. But it's also good to have because even if you're not allergic to bees and you know you're not allergic, any random day that you get stung could be the day that you your body decides, you know, oh, guess we're allergic to bees now. So just something to bear in mind, but uh, you sh what I'm saying is you shouldn't be discouraged by reading up on, on bee diseases to think like, oh, the, these are very fragile animals. It's not too common to come across their diseases, and even if you do, they're usually pretty easy to deal with. There's a few that aren't, and I'm going to be talking about a few other obstacles that bees have in their survival uh, as well, like so not just diseases, but also like predators, parasites, uh, just things of that sort. So, uh, let's start with the three most common, uh, larval diseases. Um, there's, there's one called foul brood, which is divided into two. There's, is actually, I, I said three diseases. It's two forms of foul brood and then a, a chalk brood. But, uh, there's European foul brood and there's American foul brood. And the reason why they're called that is exactly what it sounds like. If uh, the larvae get this, they sort of, like, decompose, and it smells horrible. So, that's that's the thing. If you open a beehive and it smells bad, something is very wrong. Beehives smell wonderful. They're very clean animals. Um, it, they actually, it actually reminds me of buckwheat. Just a really lovely, floral, sweet... But not, not not saccharine sweet, just a wonderful smell. Like like it's the kind of smell like if you walked into a spa, you'd be like, that's a perfect smell for a spa. That's what beehives smell like. If it smells foul, if there's a sour aroma, something's wrong. And a lot of times it's foul brood. And the way you can test uh, for which kind of foul brood is just take a uh, uh, a toothpick and insert it into uh, the cell and draw it out. And if it kind of coils up then uh, you've got American foul brood, and if it doesn't, you've got European foul brood. The other kind of uh, disease, and incidentally, the best way of dealing with uh, foul brood, get rid of the infected larvae, and that's really about it. Uh, it's, it's not the end of, of the world unless you see it on a large scale. Uh, what, what happens is uh, spores get brought from infected honey, from infected flowers, or sometimes, and this is one little thing, do not feed your bees honey from other sources. If you're going to feed them, feed them sugar water. I know a lot of people think that's not right, you know, a little, you know, that doesn't seem very organic. Well, you could run the risk of them getting foul brood as a result. And the other kind of brood disease is chalk brood. And chalk brood, it, it's a similar kind of infection, but it does the opposite. Instead of, like, decaying, the, the larvae just sort of mummify. 
Um, so yeah, that, those are those are two things to look out for. If you see desiccated larvae, now that's not the same thing as oh, you know, I didn't even think of this. This isn't a disease though. Chill brood. If it's winter time and and you go out and you see larvae uh, have been sort of kicked out. What's happened is the internal temperature of the hive wasn't sufficient in some areas, and the poor little larvae, they got like hypothermia and died. Well, the cold-blooded equivalent hypothermia. Anyway, uh, and they, they got rid of them to prevent, you know, infection from spreading, because again, bees are very clean animals. So that's chill brood, um, which isn't a disease. Like I said, it's a mechanical problem. Uh, let's see, what are the other uh, big diseases? Oh, uh... Uh, speaking of winter time, nosema. Nosema is something you'll pretty much never see in the summer. Interesting little fact about bees. They always go out to do their business. They're very clean little animals, like I said. The only bee that doesn't do this is the queen, and they, you know, they take that out for her. They, they clean up after her. Um, so th th that's something that's very clean about them. Well, here's a problem. If it's cold... They can't go out because they're cold-blooded. Poikilothermic is the preferred term. So what do they do? Well, they just hold it. If they hold it for very long, like really long, like you got a really bad winter, sometimes they can get sort of looks like the bee equivalent of dysentery. And you will know this immediately. Again, beehives are supposed to be very clean. If you see what looks to be like feces smeared on the outside of the hive, uh, or even worse, on the inside you've got nosema. Unfortunately, that's one of those things where there's not really, I mean, really you just cross your fingers and hope for a warm day. That's that's the big issue. Um, but what what causes this is, you know, uh, feces sort of like at, at, not atrophies, like de decomposes in their guts somewhat and they end up with a uh, disease. So yeah, very, very unpleasant. Um, now we're moving on from like regular diseases, diseases to parasites because those are some of the, the bigger issues. Um, less famous is the uh, tropolapse, tropilla, tropilolapse um, mite. They are uh, not nearly as famous as the one I'm going to discuss in a moment, um, but they can be incredibly damaging. They cause deformations in the uh, pupa and the adults. And the best way to test for that is, you know, I, I mentioned in my entomology videos that bees have four wings, but it looks like they have two. Well, if you see bees with their wings folded, like, out from one another, like in an L shape, something is wrong. Uh, and that's caused by that particular um, mite and what happens is that these these mites actually enter the cells uh, where the the larvae are and they just start parasitizing the babies the larvae and it in result is is just these malformations that, in, that include wing damage um, in order to deal with that really you I mean I'm, I'm all for the whole organic when you can but you're going to need miticide to deal with that. Otherwise, they will absolutely destroy a hive. Now, also, the, the more famous mite that uh, people associate with famous um, mite is Varroa destructor. It's even in the name. Varroa destructor is uh, an absolute plague on, on aviaries. Um, aviaries. Apiaries. Um, one interesting way of treating varroas that are uh, diagnosing them rather that I highly encourage people to do I've never had to do it but I've seen people do it and I absolutely think it's a great um, natural way and I'm, I'm not Mr. Woo Woo I'm not not saying that everything in beekeeping I mean I just encourage people to use miticide and incidentally for varroas also the solution is miticide but here's an interesting way of diagnosing varroa um, that you know the the more modern uh, less kind, less compassionate to the bees tactic is, uh, man, my lips look awful. Um, the, the more negative tactic that, that you see commonly today, it's somewhat exploitative, is to just cut open a bunch of the comb where the larvae are and inspect the larvae. And 
you know, the larvae end up dying. But, you know, you will see some of the, the brood have uh, uh, varroa mites on them. Well, here's another way that you can test for varroa. Because they also uh, latch on to the adults. And a lot of times if one feeds on a larva, they'll, they'll still be on it once it turns into an adult. So anyway, what you do, no joke, smoke the bees like usual, open up the hive, get a mason jar with a little cut out of screen, like a screen door kind of thing, and uh, the little lid, right? Just scoop up a bunch of them. Oh, sorry. Put powdered sugar. Forgot step two there. Put powdered sugar in the jar. Scoop up a bunch of the bees. Seal the jar. Shake them up very lightly. Don't actually hurt them. Now you can really plainly see those varroa mites if one of them has one. And... A lot of times they'll actually fall to the bottom of the jar because uh, it's a little harder to hold your footing when you're being shook around in powdered sugar. And what's great about this is, sure, it's going to piss the bees off at first, but uh, they love sugar. So they're going to be trying to get the sugar off of each other once this happens, and you're, you're not going to kill any of the brood. So I just think it's a better method of diagnosing Varroa. Once that being said, this is one of those things where you don't want to go with the, you know, grandma's apple cider vinegar nonsense. You want miticide for things like that because Varroa Destructor, as you can imagine by the name, is much more dangerous than even the other mites. So, yeah. Now we're moving on from mites to uh, just overall pests for bees. And the first one may come as a surprise, but it wouldn't if you uh, saw my previous video about different strains of bees where I talked about how Italians are more prone to be pirates, basically. And that is other bees. Bees can compete with other bees. They have little wars with each other. They will raid weaker hives for their resources. And the best way of discouraging this is, one, making sure you have healthy hives, and two, keeping some distance from them. I see some people, they'll put like four hives on a single pallet. You know, if you've got four very healthy hives, sure, that'll work out. Uh, if anything, you know, one that's slightly stronger might actually help because, uh, you know, they're going to be a deterrent for pests. But if you have a weaker hive, then you run into the risk of, of some of them being raided. And it's it's kind of like uh, nature versus nurture. Um, I mentioned in one video how hens that learn to eat their own eggs, they're never going to just be good hens after that. You might as well make dumplings out of them. Bees that have sort of learned, like, hey, it's it's a lot more profitable for our colony to just raid other colonies. They're, they're, in, they're not going to improve probably they uh, they've learned this behavior and they're going to continue that behavior so that's a serious issue you might want to uh, uh, reconsider having them in close proximity to any other hives the other big issues that you might run into with in terms of pests I'll just start listing a few off uh, wax worms that was actually my first issue as a, a hive keeper uh, beekeeper was so again guys I, I've got the flu I'm, I'm, I've got like five neurons firing sorry but uh, well, whenever I first had bees I actually my first ever colony I got a bad queen she she hadn't taken well when she was bred so she made a disproportionate amount of drone brood they didn't replace her and as the colony started decreasing, I didn't really know what I was looking at. I was like, why Why are there so few bees? I didn't really know. You know, I kind of jumped into this blind and was just learning based on experience. And eventually, I ended up with wax worms. And they tend to be an inconvenience for healthy hives. But a, they, I mean, it, they, they ended up just webbing over the whole hive and killing it. It was nuts. Of course, the hive was doomed once once uh, they decided not to replace their, their drone queen. Um, but what waxworms are is they're a kind of uh, moth that lays its eggs in bee comb and the, the larvae hatch and they eat all the resources that the bees have and then they make this horrible, difficult to clean, even by bee standards, silk that just meshes a lot of the frames together and it's just very unpleasant. Uh, and of course they also get droppings places and again a healthy hive will, will kill one pretty quickly or even several. But one that's struggling can really uh, just go to pot quickly because of waxworms. And incidentally, waxworms are also the things that you see at bait shops and uh, feeder shops for, like, uh, you know, tarantulas and other pets. They're very common uh, feeder animal. They're actually bred deliberately by people for those purposes. 
Um, wasps will raid. That's a common one. They actually uh, prefer the larvae. Uh, a misconception. A lot of people think that wasps and bears attack bees for honey. They want the larvae. The larvae have the protein. That's what they want. Um, and lastly, ants. Now, wasps are a threat, but again, that's, that's also only weaker hives. And there's, the only thing you could really do is make a wasp trap near the hive if, if raiding starts. It's kind of one of those things that hopefully you won't have to deal with because it's, there's not a lot you could do. Uh, but ants, there's an interesting little technique you can have. If, if you're having real trouble with ants, um, one thing you can do, and most commonly I see this with people who have theirs just on a pallet, is either put them on a raised platform or put them on something like a table, um, you know, and you can get really dirt cheap tables, anything with legs that will support the full hive, um, and put a little cup of motor oil under each leg. The, the ants aren't going to be able to cross that. So that's one of the advantages. Ants can't fly, and bees always enter the hive by flying in. So that's a great way of, of dealing with that. And also, like, like wasps, ants are raiding mostly for uh, larvae, not for honey. So, yeah, there you have it. Those are the big diseases and pest issues that you might run into. And, again, to reiterate, if a colony is kept strong, and the strength of a colony is based on whether they have access to good resources, like a variety of different flowers, and good queen genetics. That's the two big things. If they have those two things, they should be, unless there's like a natural disaster that messes with them, like a tornado knocks them over, they should be strong. And if they're strong, then these issues will not be very likely. And the ones that are, like in the case of the mites, um, the treatment would be miticide, and that's, those are things you can do. Now here's a little catch-all thing that you can also do for a lot of diseases. Um, you can actually make bee medicine, and all it really is is it's just sugar patties, the regular sugar patties um, that, that I'll uh, tell people to make in, I guess, the next episode. It's, it's bee food. It's especially good for winter. If you make that, but you add just a few drops of menthol, menthol, yeah, peppermint, bees they, they kind of like it. I think they prefer regular sugar, but they'll gladly eat it. And what's great about it is menthol, you know, the reason why menthol as a plant exists is it repels a lot of things, including mites and pest insects. It really does uh, a good job of doing that. It keeps other things that hurt the bees away. So, yeah. Anyway, like, share, subscribe. Keep asking questions. Bye.